I come from a line of sturdy Jewish women. My body, shtetl made and Minnesota raised, was created with resilience. To withstand marital strife like my grandma Marlene, and maternal grief like my Saftabani. These are the women who make up my ancestry, whose genes and gumption, whose pain and joy are my inheritance. My Safta, along with many other women of her generation and even more before her, has a story that is unscribed and barely even spoken. Like many of the matriarchs on whose shoulders I stand, her sadness is sewed into needlepoint pillows her joy stewed in a hearty Shabbos brisket. Is mein Leben an oisgeflickt Blatt von a Sefer und die Schure die erste Pharisin? My life is a page ripped out of a holy book, and part of the first line is missing. In 1927, Yiddish poet Kadia Molodowski wrote her stories into a series of poems called Freudian Lieder, Women's Songs. Molodowski reaches to the past to imagine a conversation with her ancestors and our matriarchs and extends a hand forward to link that lineage to us. Is mein Leben ein oiskeflickt Blatt von a Sefer? Our holy book's beginning tells a family narrative whose action is driven by patriarchs who are promised over and over that their offspring will fill the earth as the stars fill the sky. God's assurance of progeny is the echo of Sefer Breshit. Count the stars if you can, the grains of sand on the seas. Have no fear, Avraham. Don't be afraid, Yitzchak. I will not leave you, Yaakov until your children cover the earth like the very dust upon it. In Parshas Vaishlach, this promise is both satisfied and spoiled by the birth of Binyamin and the death of Rachel. Und die die erste Pharisin, when God makes these promises of pru or vu, our mothers are glaringly missing from the mise-en-scene. The very bodies that will bear and birth God's breet into being are left out of the prophetic experience, left to wonder about their own infertility, until suddenly, surprised and suspicious, they find themselves pregnant. Reflecting on this repeated dynamic, I'm reminded of another matriarch story to have suffered infertility. Her name is Yalta, and she stars in a favorite Talmudic tale of mine. Yalta sits with her husband, Rav Nachman, and Ula, a guest in their home. They eat, recite Birkat Hamazon, and Ula passes the kos shel bracha, the cup of blessing, to Rav Nachman. Pass it to Yalta, insists Rav Nachman. To do so would be useless, says Ula. For we are taught in a Brita that whoever recites a meal's final blessing over the kos shel bracha shall be blessed with fertility, and the fruit of a woman's body is blessed only through the fruit of a man's body. Rav Nachman needs the blessing, argues Ula, not Yalta. As the men talk about her without her, Yalta rises in a rage. She goes to the wine storage and shatters 400 barrels of wine, her anger teaching a powerful Torah with no vessel to contain it. Wine will spill forth freely like blood. When we are missing from the conversation, expect rage, expect shock, angst and infighting, expect tears, trauma, and generations of bitter weeping. When Sarah is missing from Avraham's sweet scene beneath the stars, she laughs in disbelief. 
When Yitzchak pleads to God without Rivka by his side, she turns to God herself asking, Im Kain, Lama Ze Anochi, if I am to endure this pain, why do I exist? When Leah is unloved, her childbearing becomes competitive sport with her once beloved and now rivaled sister. And Rachel, unable to dream her way out of barrenness, is turned to madness. Haveli vanim ve'im ein meta anochi, give me children or I shall die. When Rachel finally gives birth, she names the child Yosef, praying, may Hashem add another son for me, a prayer whose answer would finally come in overwhelming birth pain and family tragedy. They set out from Bethel, but when they were still some distance short of Ephrat, Rachel was in childbirth and she had hard labor. When her labor was at its hardest, the midwife said to her, Have no fear, for it is another son for you. Imagine this tender moment between two women. Our nameless midwife guiding new life from his mother's womb, as she stares into the eyes of a terrified Rachel. The focused inhales and exhales of her contractions, Rachel's final breaths. Vaihi betzeit nafsha ki meta vatikrashimo ben oni. But as she breathed her last, for she was dying, she named him Ben Oni. The Aviv Karalo Ben Yamin, the Tamat Rachel. But his father called him Ben Yamin, and thus Rachel died. Years later, her husband's death will draw all his children around him will be narrated by the individual brachot he bestows on each of their heads. But Rachel's death washes over us in a single breath, a whispered name, Ben-Oni. Son of my suffering. The words still hang in the air as Yaakov renames the child. Ben Oni becomes Ben Yamin, the right hand. In this moment of unspeakable grief, Yaakov turns the son of his mother's suffering into the son of his father's strength. And while I can empathize with Yaakov, forced as he is to bury his beloved Rachel in Beit Lechem, her body too bloodless to carry to Ma'arat HaMachpelah, as Chizkuni teaches us. I am nevertheless stung by his virtual erasure of Rachel's final act of naming. Rachel's suffering, the sound of it on her breath, as her soul leaves her body, deserves to be heard. Isafta's suffering deserves to be heard, hushed as it has been all her life. As a woman in her early 20s, she gave birth to my Aunt Margie, my mother Elka, and three more girls, Susan, Jane, and Sally. I never met these aunts. All born in the 1950s with Canavan's disease, a fatal genetic disorder, my Safta had no true outlet for her suffering, when each of her daughters died at tragically young ages. She and my Saba Al never worked through the trauma together, and to this day she avoids discussing it for fear of drawing too much attention to her pain. Everyone has Suris, I can hear her saying in her thick Minnesotan accent, 
Why should anyone have to hear about mine? I imagine she's feeling that today as she listens. Safta, you who live your life each day of it with undeniable joy. I want only to breathe your suffering into the world, to name it. We must sing our suffering in order to heal. We, the women, the mothers, the midwives, the wine spillers. We must be the ones to reach across time and beckon our matriarchs outside, aiding the delivery of their redemption, their revelation beneath the boundless heavens. We must follow Rachel's example, who takes a first step towards this intergenerational healing when invoked in Jeremiah's prophecy of a redeemed future. Kol berama nishma nihi bechi tamrumim, Rachel mevaka al baneha, me'ana lihinachem al baneha ki enenu. A cry is heard in Ramah, wailing, bitter weeping, Rachel weeping for her children. She refuses to be comforted for her children who are gone. Koamar Hashem, min i kolach mi bechi ve enayich mi dima, ki yesh sachar lafulatech neum adonai ve shavu meeretz oyev. Thus says Hashem, restrain your voice from weeping, your eyes from shedding tears, for there is a reward for your labor. Your children shall return. Rachel's suffering is met with God's rachamim. And finally, a promise and prophecy of children is made directly between Hashem and matriarch. And thus, Rachel becomes mother of all Israel. I hear Rachel's redemptive cries, hers and Yalta's and Safta's and ours, as I read the opening lines of Freuden Lieder. Es wollen die Freuden von unserer Mischpoche bei Nacht in, un, in Chalamus mir kommen und sagen, the faces of women long dead of our family come back in the night, come in dreams to me, saying, we have kept our blood pure through generations, we brought it to you like a sacred wine from the kosher cellars of our hearts. And I will go and meet the grandmothers, saying, Your whimperings race past me like autumn winds, and your words are the silken cord still binding my thoughts. Un is mein Leben an oiska flit blatt von a sefer un die Schure die erste verrissen. My life is a page ripped out of a holy book, and part of the first line is missing. <laughs> 